Okay, everybody. So welcome. As you can see, uh, we're here with Professor Eric Rigneau. Um, and pretty soon, we hope, one of his graduate students, Jehan Kim, who are in Greenland right now. Jehan is actually out on the boat and I think on, on the way in. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Eric is a, uh, a renowned glaciologist who's regularly featured on many news outlets, magazines, uh, Vice videos. Uh, he's a chancellor's professor at UCI and a senior research scientist at NASA JPL. His research group is all about understanding interactions between ice and climate, and in particular, how the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland will respond to climate change. Um, for this, Eric and his students travel the world. They go to Greenland to conduct experiments, and we're gonna hear about this today. They, they embark on research ships, boats, helicopters, and do cool stuff, uh, and that's what we're excited about. So, so Eric, welcome. Thanks for doing this for us. Uh, where are you now? What are we looking at? What's going on? Thank you, James. Uh, thank you for the welcome message. Uh, I am in uh, Ilulisat uh, on the western coast of, uh, of Greenland. It's, uh, it's actually the most touristic part of Greenland. So they, they triple their population in the summer. But this is not summer. So <laughs> you can count the foreigners on, uh, on, 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 the, on your 12 fingers here. Uh, it's mostly local people. Uh, and I'm outside of a house where we stay uh, in this in this little town of uh, Ilulisat, there's about 5,000 people, which is big for Greenland. And uh, I'm waiting for the rest of the team who went on the boat to drop some instruments. Um, uh, on, on, my, on my patio, and uh, I, have, I have some instruments here, you know, like we, we deploy on the sea ice uh, that are waiting for my uh, key engineers and students to operate. That's cool. So, what do you got? What are you in Greenland for? What do you? What's the? What's the goal of this research trip? So, we are next to the biggest glacier in Greenland. It's called Jakob uh, uh, and it's fjord, which has never been uh, surveyed completely. Uh, so, that's the goal of uh, this experiment, and which we started last year to to map the water depth in the fjord and uh, water temperature. And it's a very challenging area because it's uh, usually always covered by sea ice and iceberg debris. So we come at this time of the year when the sea ice is break breaking up uh, at the beginning of spring, because that's the only time of the year where the fjord can become ice free for a very short period. So we are like on the watch out, uh, ready with our boat to jump in if your fjord is clear to go map it with uh, multi beam uh, sonars and take some ocean temperature data. And this is critical to understand the evolution of this uh, glacier, um, the largest in Greenland, uh, in response to climate change and, and the warming of the ocean waters. So that's super. I mean, so what what are you doing on this trip that's building off of previous discoveries? And, and also, tell us a little bit about the tools you're using. You talked about being on a boat. I think I saw some footage of a helicopter you were using. So talk, talk to me about those, those kind of things. Yeah, so this is building up on uh, years of uh, experiments in Greenland. I think we started in, 2000, uh, in 2008, uh, but geez, a long time, uh, mapping the seafloor of, of, the, of the fjords, the glacial fjords, because it's, most of them were unknown, uh, uh, documenting ocean temperature. That seems like a pretty straightforward thing, but uh, it's actually a little bit challenging at times in this environment because these fjords are of course, occupied by glaciers, which carve icebergs, and uh, icebergs are choking these, uh, these waters. So the navigation is always a little bit hazardous. That's, mm. that's a good reason why they've never been mapped. And uh, this year is, is particularly exciting because we have multiple tools at hand. Uh, you know, it's, it's always difficult to do things around here. So if you just have one instrument for one particular condition, you're pretty limited, uh, which is what happened to us last year. So this year we have a boat when the sea ice uh, is favorable for us to navigate in the fjord. Uh, we have also uh, this, uh, I, I tell the locals, it's a torpedo, um, which is a, a, a multi-beam sonar that we can lower through a, a hole in the sea ice. So we can uh, map the seafloor uh, by landing on the sea ice. We can land by helicopter uh, or uh, we have also a traverse that we do with snowmobile uh, with some local people, which is a, 
very fun. And we, we sort of try to get to these places that are very hard to reach that we've never been able to reach in the past um, because uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, rough ice in that area. It's very challenging. And of course, they're close to the glaciers. Um, so we need to be careful that we operate in an area where the glaciers may not break up into a big icebergs and, and send us swimming in frigid water. So it sounds pretty dangerous, Eric. I mean, are you, what kind of precautions do you take to make sure you're, you're safe? Well, the main way for me to be safe is to work with uh, what I would call field professionals. Uh, if it was just up to me, I think I would probably have had an accident already. So I work with uh, professional sailors, sailors and uh, professional engineers, people who are very trained, uh, much more than me in these conditions. Uh, uh, the main captain of my team here as somebody who was uh, overwintered in, in Greenland and lived on his boat for 10 years. So he's, he has a lot of experience with that. Uh, and when we fly with helicopters, also we, we fly with very experimented pilots uh, from Norway, Sweden, and sometimes Greenland. Uh, we can ask us the tough questions. Uh, like the first question the pilot asked me this year when we explained to him what we wanted to do is, uh, have you done this before? And I told him, no, this is, a, this is our first time doing this sort of thing of landing on the sea ice. Um, but that was a very good question to start with. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, we have a question here from Reg Penner who's asking, this mapping of the fjord bottom, um, how many years does this take? Uh, does this, is this multiple years? And can you also say something about the multi-beam capability of your sonar? Yeah, so it's multiple years. I said we started in 2008. The, the, the project we're working for right now is funded by NASA and it started in 2015. Uh, we've mapped a whole lot of fjords in Greenland. Um, I didn't do most of it. Most of it was done by a couple of uh, expeditions on a large ship. I'm, I'm doing more of the gap filler, uh, going in these places that are more difficult to do with a conventional ship because there's a lot of uh, ice in the fjords. Um, and, and this could take a long time uh, because these places are, are the most challenging. So we're doing little by little. Uh, and, and we're also developing technology uh, to eventually go beneath uh, what we call ice shelf, floating extension of the glacier ice, which we find in the north, uh, which we absolutely need to explore with robotic devices. So some of the tools that we're testing uh, today, like uh, uh, this torpedo I mentioned uh, before, uh, has a multi-beam sonar on it. So instead of measuring the seafloor depth just right beneath the instrument with a, a, a single acoustic uh, wave, we have an array of these uh, uh, microphones that send signal to the seafloor and we can sweep a large sector of the seafloor all, all at once. In fact, almost a kilometer here in, in this case with this instrument. And when we are on a ship, we can even go broader than that. So if we go in a fjord that's a few kilometers wide with a boat, we can map the fjord pretty quickly. Um, if we have to hop around with our torpedo and land on the sea ice, and make a one kilometer diameter, it's gonna take, it's gonna take a little bit longer to get there. Ah, wow. So, so I wanna ask you a couple more things about it, but first I'm wondering, what are we looking at here? Like what's right behind you? Is that the bay? I, it's hard for me to tell, like where are you standing now and, and what are we seeing in the, in the field yeah, of view? So that's a good question, James. So uh, this is Disco Bay and uh, the, this is the town of Ilulisat behind me. Um, if I, turn around a little bit let's see you might see the icebergs back there yeah uh, they are coming from uh fjord the the fjord we're starting is just around the corner uh so some of these big icebergs are coming from this glacier uh, uh and we have to sort of navigate in between those to get to uh, to the glacier this is the rest of the town of ilulisat which has some uh, some nice mountain around it uh and then across it, I'm not sure the contrast will be good enough. You may see in the foreground an island with some more glaciers and more snow. It's Disco Island. And um, in the winter, 
that all area is covered by sea ice and the locals travel by snowmobile from uh, Irulisat to Disco Island to get to some uh, other hunting ground. But right now, of course, it's uh, sea ice is already gone. So they go by boat. Yeah. Oh, okay. Fascinating. All right. We're getting, we're getting a few questions here. Um, so, okay. So we have a question, which is how often are calving events? Uh, and how often do they interfere with scheduled field work in the fords and in the fjords? So how often does this happen? Yeah, but it doesn't happen so often, right? It's, it's not really on a daily basis. Um, but when it happens, it can be a very big calving event. That's going to take probably, uh, 10, 15 minutes to develop. Uh, that may sound like a long, a long time, but it's it's really a time if you close the glacier where you have to get out. Uh, so we never put ourselves in conditions such that if there's a big calving event happening to us, uh, the iceberg is gonna fall on our heads. We, we stay a minimum distance from the glacier, but these uh, glaciers, when they calve in the ocean, um, they send a wave, which is not exactly a wave. It's actually a tsunami. And uh, for those uh, who know what tsunamis are, uh, they carry a lot of energy. Um, if we're in the middle of the fjord, it's gonna be a little bit of a up and down on the boat. But if we're on the side of the fjord, when that happens, uh, we can be swept away by a wave of several meters uh, against the rock. So these, these are dangerous places to, to go. The other thing that can happen is um, these icebergs melt from below and uh, they can unpredictably roll over um, and they, they seem like tiny when uh, when you see them uh, on the ocean but we tend to forget that uh, there's nine times more ice below the surface so they, when they start toppling over uh, the, the bottom part of the iceberg is gigantic and can sweep uh, the the area almost a kilometer around the iceberg. So if you're on a boat when that happens, uh, you, you just have to get out of there. And that's also why we try not to stay close to icebergs because we know they can they can roll over any time. Uh, sometimes they can also split in half unpredictably mm -hmm. um, and 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 start separating from each other and and going at a pretty steady speed. Nothing can stop them. Um, so that's also another time where you don't want to be uh, too close. But in all these years in, uh, in in Greenland, I think we had a couple of close calls, but not so much. You know, if 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 you're careful enough, you can really minimize the danger. Wow. So what what do you think is going to be the the most challenging, or has been the most challenging um, thing that you're going to be working on while you're while you're there? Well. Uh, in Greenland, like they say, nothing is easy, so it, it never quite works as we hope. Uh, 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 the weather, um, electronics, um, making sure we're safe, uh, the ice conditions, there's so many, uh, so many variables. I think when we get some good data, we feel, we feel sort of very fortunate, but uh, at the same time, it can be a little bit stressful because we invest uh, so much time and energy in preparing for this thing. There's always a risk that uh, uh, something major is gonna fail and not work. Uh, uh, a cable missing, a battery dying. Uh, we were operating our ice drill yesterday and, and the battery caught on fire. Now we, oh, you, have, you have some spare for that, but um, anything can happen. So when you get some good data, you feel, you feel mm. pretty fortunate. Wow. Um so t talk to us about the climate mysteries that you're you're waiting to solve there. So what are some of these climate change related questions that you think are still that, that are that are essential, you know, that drive you to go to Greenland and study these things? Yeah, so the the the, the crux of what we do here is to understand the role of the ocean on these glaciers. We know that uh, the ocean plays a major role in the evolution of Greenland glaciers. We we all heard about the melting of the snow and ice surface from a warmer air temperature, but uh, by far the largest vector of potential rapid sea level rise in the future is the fact that the ocean waters are getting warmer, melting the glaciers from below and, and causing them to speed up. Um, so when we started this line of work uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago, there are very few um, documentation of the ocean temperature in the fjord, the depth of the fjord, 
Uh, I did not mention why this is important, but uh, the heat in this fjord is, is at depth. It's not near the surface. It's several hundred meters below the surface. So we absolutely need to know how deep these fjords are to figure out if warm water from the North Atlantic is able to reach them or not, and then check just how warm the temperature is down there. Uh, and we want to see how this is changing with time, with changes in atmospheric circulation in the Arctic, uh, uh, controlled by climate change, basically by uh, how we change the climate, how we change the composition of our atmosphere and the, the greenhouse gases. So at stake is to understand these interactions better so we can uh, make the numerical models in charge of projecting sea level rise from Greenland better. And right now, um, this work is especially important because we are sort of missing a complete description of this ocean component. And we know that as a result, the projection are, are too conservative. Uh, we're not projecting as much sea level rise from Greenland as there will be uh, until we sort of nail down uh, uh, these processes taking, up, uh, taking action on the glaciers uh, in the ocean waters. So this project and another project ongoing in Greenland are, are focusing on that. And we're making great progress. So it's, it's, uh, this, is, uh, this is exciting. And, and then we can have people like uh, Mathieu at UCI and others using this to revise the projections. Yeah, this is fundamentally interesting. I mean, let me just add, you know, there's a couple of questions that are popping up here um, that I can ask. So, so therefore, what do you think will be the most important result of, of what you discover here. I guess it will be measuring the rate, you know, relating to the rate of how quickly these things are melting and, and things like that. Yeah, uh, what we are tackling uh, the most uh, this year in the fjord is to uh, not only measure the fjord depth to, to find if there are some natural obstacle that block the access of warm water. So these fjords are never uniform in depth. There's some places where you have uh, ridges and these ridges can block the access of warm water. Uh, until we, we map those features, we just have no idea how the ocean heat is transferred to the glacier. So we're starting to uh, unravel that in uh, Ilulisat Fjord, but uh, we nowhere near the end of it. Uh, we've we've yeah. mapped, about, mapped about a third of the glacier. We haven't found these, uh, these ridges close to the ice front. Uh, we still are eluding um, our instruments, but we, we're sort of working on it. Uh, until we have that, it's, it's, it's difficult to accept any uh, 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 projection from the uh, ice sheet models because there'll be a question mark on exactly how things work. And I think this is related to that question mark, but I'll ask a question that Pierre Baldi asked. Um, he writes, if we were to reverse global warming, which maybe I, we can assume, you know, maybe just no more temperature rise at all, um, what happens to the polar ice? Does it keep melting? Does it come back? Do we know? Um, even if we were to just completely go carbon neutral, do we know what would happen? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid the answer is not exactly what you would like to hear. Um, we, we sort of passed the point of a stable green and ice sheet uh, already. Uh, uh, even if we were stopping a carbon emission right now, you know, the the climate system will still react for another 30 years before it will feel the fact that we're not emitting carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, so Greenland will, will, will keep warming up for another 20, 30 years and will not, uh, the end state of that will not be a climate regime that will make the ice sheet stable. It will, it will keep melting. Um, what, what we're facing right now is, is a choice between melting, melting Greenland very rapidly and, and risking some periods in the future where sea level rise will go 10 times, 20 times faster than today, or melting it very slowly, which will be a little bit better for adaptation to our coastlines. Uh, if we really want to sort of stop the process, uh, not only we have to zero out our carbon emissions, but we have to also work on uh, storing some of atmospheric carbon back into the ground, carbon sequestration and bring the climate uh, back to what it was, you know, more like in the 1980s or even earlier. Uh, that's sort of the challenge we have if we wanted to bring things back to how they used to be. So Eric, one of the things I think people worry about, and this touches on a question from Reg, is with all of this melting and what's happening in the oceans, 
I think there's some there's concerns about things like the Gulf Stream. Do we can you can you talk a bit about that and, and what would happen if the Gulf Stream uh, gets blocked or reversed or stalled? Um, what are the implications there? Yeah, so that's sort of a long term catastrophic scenario as you melt more of Greenland, you send a large pulse of fresh water into the North Atlantic waters and that pulse of fresh water that stays more at the surface has the potential of, uh, of stopping the turmoil line circulation in, in the North Atlantic. Uh, uh, basically in the North Atlantic, the Gulf Stream brings a lot of heat from the tropics and at some point, uh, the, the, all these waters plunge into the deep and start returning south at, at, at depth and, and, and carry a lot of his heat around the globe like that. Uh, there's models indicate that if we put more melt water into the North Atlantic, we can actually stop that pump, that, that heat pump, uh, and that would change the climate over the whole planet because the Gulf Stream plays an enormous role uh, in, the, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, the model so far suggests that you need to put a lot of melt water in the North Atlantic in order to shut it down. Uh, but they also show that uh, the effect could be a little bit linear. So the more melt water we pour into the North Atlantic, the more that circulation could slow down. Uh, the jury is still out uh, on that right now. Uh, some papers come out and say, we're seeing a slowdown. Some others come out and say, well, we're not so sure. Uh, but the models indicate there's a real risk down the line. Uh, but you know, what, what Greenland sends in the ocean right now is a little bit of a trickle. Uh, what the model clearly indicates is you need to send a lot more melt water very quickly in order to disrupt the Gulf Stream. So it, it really depends on what you find. I mean, if you, if you see this acceleration, um, it could be very bad for the Gulf Stream. I guess that's one potential yeah, outcome. So the, the big unknown uh, in, in, in this uh, projection, James, is uh, the scenario of very rapid sea level rise. Um, if things continue as they are today, uh, you could say it's not so bad, but we are worried about uh, catastrophic scenarios. Once the glaciers reach some threshold, the ocean warming reach some threshold, where things could actually spin up and we could have a much more rapid sea level rise from Greenland and other places in Antarctica. That's the big unknown. That's kind of the tail end of the system. Uh, but we know that this tail end of the system has been acting out in the past. Um, we had periods where sea level was rising 40 millimeters per year instead of three millimeters per year uh, 14,000 years ago. So when, when these things kick in, uh, they could have a big impact uh, uh, on, on all of us. And we don't know exactly um, when they will kick in, how much time, more time we have, and this sort of thing. So this research is a small contribution to trying to address that. Hmm. So getting back a little bit to your research, we got a few other questions. So how, how do interactions on the ice sheet near where you are now affect other parts of the ice sheet? Um, are they, do they influence each other? Are there local effects that then propagate? How does that, how does that work? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So the, the ocean circulation around Greenland is, is complex. You know, it, it, it proceeds from uh, the North Atlantic reaching uh, off the coast of Iceland, deflected around East Greenland, and then it goes in a clockwise fashion all around Greenland. Uh, we here in Jakob Savin Fjord, it's the biggest glacier in Greenland, but it's just one of the largest 200 glaciers in Greenland. Uh, even if we have a good understanding of what's happening in Jakob Savin at some point in time, uh, we still need to study the other glaciers as well. Uh, so this is a good place to work. This is an important glacier, but uh, we need to have a more comprehensive view of, of the entire island in, in order to do things right. So that's a very good point. What's happening in this fjord may not necessarily be completely relevant to a fjord that's, uh, that we found uh, 200 kilometers up north. Mm. Uh, where the ocean waters can be a little bit different, the uh, ocean regime can be affected in a different way. And maybe this is related. Um, another question is how much research in Greenland is done um, on the coast versus the interior? So are you sort of getting in wherever you can or, or what's, the, what's that look like? Well, so we have a little bit of flexibility here on doing this coastal work, you know, because uh, uh, the resources we use, uh, uh, ships uh, or snowmobile or, or 
uh, or, 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 or helicopters are available. Once you go in the interior, uh, there are no towns, no locals living oh, right. there. <laughs> You're on your own. So the logistics is, uh, is vastly different, vastly more complex uh, in the interior. But most of the studies in the interior focus on the, on the deep drilling, looking at ice cores, climate records. That's super important. And these projects bring hundreds of people together from uh, uh, all nations. Uh, so it's, it's a, different, a different magnitude effort. Um, we have a little bit of an inside baseball question here, I think, from Helen Chang. She's asking, how is the Argo Marine 29-foot workboat vessel working there in Greenland? This must be someone who's familiar with <laughs> your, your vessel. Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, going into these fjords is a little bit tricky. You cannot quite go with a big ship, a big research vessel like uh, NSF would operate in the Antarctic because they can't even turn around in these fjords uh, without hitting an iceberg. Uh, and, and the small boats can be crushed by the ice. So you, you have to find some compromise uh, on, on what you can use to navigate in these fjords. We have a relatively small boat. It's a rescue boat for 20 passengers. But um, we, if you saw in the video, it's, it's, it's really good for four or five people. That's actually what we can afford at UCI. So but we very, feel very fortunate we have that. But uh, in, in the face of the problem we, we, we're tackling, we can say, you know, we, we're climbing Everest with our tennis shoes here. We're doing the best we can. Uh, but this boat is very efficient in, in, this, uh, in these glacial fjords. Um, I don't think there's an optimum boat. The big boats can cover a lot of ground very easily and very comfortably. And we go into the smaller, more treacherous areas and uh, we feel a little bit better with uh, a little bit more in control of what's going on with our small boats and, and, and have more maneuverability in, inside the fjord. So speaking of that, let me just remind everybody, if you want to support this research, you can do so if you text uh, PSCC to the number 41444. Um, you know, e even small amounts actually are quite helpful because um, you, there's certain things that that you from grants you you just can't spend money on unless it's pre allocated. So really, any level of funding would be appreciated. So thanks for that. Uh, we've got a time for a couple more questions, Eric. Really appreciate your time, but we know you're busy. Um, Larry Overman's asking, how great is the temperature differential as you go to depth in the Fjords. You mentioned a little bit about this, but how, how are temperatures changing? How rapidly as you go down? Yeah. So when we started the experiment here, when I came, it was uh, it was 28 degrees Fahrenheit below freezing. Uh, uh, today is, is a much more pleasant day. I don't actually know how warm it is, but typically you have very cold temperature um, at the surface. Uh, uh, in the upper part of the ocean water, you have cold temperatures from this cold air. So you have freezing of the seawater at minus two Celsius, uh, which creates the sea ice. And when you go to depth, you find what I call the warm water, but it's all relative. Uh, we're talking about water at plus two degrees C. So four degrees above the melting point, four or five degrees the melting point, it's not warm enough. You could actually swim in it. Uh, but in terms of uh, ocean heat carried by this water towards the glacier, it's a lot of heat. Uh, yeah. That, Relates Great. to the heat capacity of water, as physicists yes. call will will appreciate. So, so Eric, not uh, that not that warm, not that warm, but still a lot of heat. There's still a lot of energy. So, uh, just before we close off here, can you tell us a little bit about? I know we were hoping to be joined by one of your students who's out on a boat doing cool stuff, but tell us a little bit about the things that graduate students get to do when they come out with you on a on a trip like this? What kind of stuff do they get involved in if, if you're a grad well, student in SS? We have the proof today that the students do actually all the work. Here I am chatting with you guys <laughs> my terrace, and my student is hard at work on the boat. Uh, he launched uh, this robotic CTD uh, offshore, which uh, uh, does a yo-yo in the water. And when it comes to the surface, it sends data back, uh, back to a satellite, similar to the Argo program, except this one can operate under ice and um, uh, some of these probes can be launched by uh, uh, airplanes or helicopter. We're doing it from a boat and we're testing uh, how these probes are gonna operate in Ilulisat Fjord. Uh, he's also involved in the snowmobile trip and uh, working with our equipment. You know, some of his equipment you mentioned, uh, 
the importance of donation for some of his work. A lot of his electronic was actually uh, developed uh, uh, using uh, some internal funds at UCI. Uh, it's really important for us to have that, to develop some of his instruments, test them out, and then go to agencies to say, you know, we, we want to operate them in some, in some fjord uh, on a larger scale. Uh, we need to first demonstrate that we have the right type of instruments uh, for them to trust us uh, to, to do this work. So the students do a lot of work and they're young and full of energy. Uh, Jehan is also an excellent cook, you know, that's very important for the team. Uh, he has a lot of fun here, his first time in Greenland. Uh, so, you know, it helps us look at things in a different way. You know, they, they, get, they get happy to look at the houses and how they paint their houses here and, and see the puppies walking in the street uh, and, and talk to local people who are very friendly, but you know, this is a COVID time. So we are like uh, raising question marks to local people when they see us in town, because there's no foreigners right now. Uh, Greenland is closed. We, we had to quarantine. We had to get special permission from the Greenland government. We're very thankful to that. And we have collaborators in Denmark and in Greenland. I just had a meeting with them uh, at the airport uh, today. None of that would be uh, possible without this, uh, this broad uh, collaboration. And COVID doesn't make it easy, but the good thing is uh, nobody wears masks here. We, it almost feels like we're back to a normal life. You know? And I got vaccinated and I, I got tested so many times uh, in, in the last uh, two weeks. I can't, I can't even recount by which hole they introduced what uh, to test me. Uh, so I, I think, I think I'm, I'm good, but I, I enjoy seeing the students coming here for the first time because they, they bring a lot of positive spirit and, and they, they're full of energy. They're willing to do anything. Um, yeah. I think so, we bring them into a nice place. Wonderful. I mean, so if you, if you wouldn't mind, I know if you've got a couple more minutes, um, you talked about the locals and we've got a couple questions related to Greenland. So maybe not on this trip, but in previous trips, are when you talk to locals do they talk about how things are different i mean within a lifetime are they talking about how they're seeing things melting and change and that's one oh, yeah. question and then and then yes, the other question I, is you know greenland's policies related to climate change are, are they how, how are they you know responding etc yeah so go ahead two two excellent questions uh, the, the locals have a very deep understanding of uh, climate change in greenland uh the hunters who go on sea ice um, they notice that in some places the sea ice is not safe anymore uh, they noticed that uh, new islands appear that they did not know about before. Uh, these islands appear because the permanent sea ice cover is melting away and suddenly there's a, 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 a bridge of sea ice between the land and an island that doesn't exist anymore. So you get a detached piece of land and they're very puzzled by that to see what's happening. Uh, they also continuously mentioned to me the icebergs coming out of this big glacier are getting smaller and smaller with time. And they're absolutely right. I, I know the first time I thought about that is because I heard it from them. And, mm. and then you know, thinking back to, yeah, of course, when the climate is getting warmer, the pieces detaching from the glaciers get smaller. In the Antarctic, they're very big. And in Greenland, they're very small. Um, so they, they know about this. Um, uh, they, they have a deep understanding, especially the hunters. Uh, they're not quite sure what causes it. Uh, I mean, they, they know it's climate change, but they don't necessarily understand the physical mechanism. So we are curious about that. And uh, the meeting I just had with uh, 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 local colleagues uh, uh, at noon, we talked about that. They're going around uh, the classrooms in Greenland to educate people about climate change. And it, it goes two ways. They want to learn from them, especially the old hunters, what, what they saw, what they see, and, and, and what kind of scientific information we can get from that. And in return, they want to explain to them, you know, the science, uh, the, you know, the science behind it, the physical processes at key, because they're curious about it. They would like to understand why is there a new island here? Um, so, um, we, we hope to develop more of this interaction in the future. Uh, we need the knowledge of these people and, and their help to work in Greenland. We use it all the time. And in return, uh, we want to tell them what, what the scientists know and, and also talk to the local people here. There's a lot of kids that are curious about science. Uh, 
we need to reach out to them to tell them, you know, there's room for you if you're interested, you know, in this, uh, in these studies in environmental science or earth science, you can go to school and get a diploma and, and get to do this work too. Mm -hmm. That's great. So another question is uh, about the probes and the equipment you're using. So the first is, um, who builds them? Are you building them in a lab? And the second is, are you are there other are there devices or measurement tools that you wish you had uh, that if you did, it would make your studies uh, better or more interesting? Yeah. So we we assemble a lot of these instruments ourselves, uh, but. Uh, we don't develop all the core electronics. We're using a lot of off-the-shelf stuff. So it's it's electronics that was developed for, for other things uh, that we use in uh, in these glacial fjords. Otherwise, it would be way too expensive to build all of this from scratch. Uh, so we're building toys uh, with, with a lot of uh, sort of commercial equipment. Uh, what we're working on right now is to uh, to develop uh, you know, a torpedo to have a autonomous, uh, uh, navigation uh, capability. So we're going to mount that onto uh, uh, an ROV, uh, underwater vehicle, uh, which uh, we purchased together with uh, with Mathieu Mulligan at UCI. And we hope to take that instruments underneath a large sector of uh, floating ice. So we suddenly don't monitor just a few hundred meters of uh, seafloor, but we can explore over several kilometers, five, 10, 20 kilometers of, uh, of seafloor and map large areas. So I wish we had that today. Um, uh, and I wish we could uh, operate that on, uh, on a lot of the critical fjords in Greenland so we can uh, answer some questions in a timely fashion, not over the next 10 years, but over the next two, three years. So the modelers can have this information in hand and, and do a better job uh, at reducing uncertainties of uh, projection of sea level, a step towards that. It's not, it's not that our work is going to solve all of that. Of course, that would be pretentious, but it's a, it's a small step to help. And how long are you going to be in Greenland on this trip? And how often do you do you come yeah. back? Not much longer for me. Uh, the team is going to come back in about a week's time. Um, you know, the, the trend of, of uh, modern day uh, expeditions like this is we, we, we do things short and fast, which is not always the best. Um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the old experiments in Greenland, people would stay for several months, uh, not necessarily by choice sometimes, just because they were dropped at some location and were stuck until somebody would pick them up. Um, it's, it's kind of a compromise. Uh, you can spend a lot of time here grabbing some a, a few data it, it can be very arduous uh, some of these things can be better be, be more effective at the lab uh, on the computer and going home with an, a nice meal every day uh, so, so it's sort of a compromise it, this is kind of short uh, for these kind of expeditions but we have also a lot of flexibility in Greenland we take a commercial flight here uh, we have our boat waiting for us we don't share the boat with anyone else. We, we're in full control, so we can make things uh, very efficient this way. That's great. So we have a, yeah. So here's, right. Um, so I, I know we're over time. Really appreciate it. Let's get, let's try to squeeze one more question in then, Eric. So we've got a question about the, what you're doing with your scans. And so do you take multiple measurements at a given location and average them out? Or is your sonar accurate enough that you get really great detail even with a couple scans? How does it oh, work yeah. in detail? This sonar is super accurate. We, we get to submeter uh, scale and vertical and uh, the level of details in the horizontal dimension varies depending on the scanning speed, but it's typically also a few meters but that's an overkill for what we want to do. Typically, if we if we resolve the seafloor features within a few tens of meters, we're very happy. Uh, even a hundred meters is fantastic. Uh, in in some of these fjords, uh, our, our viewpoint is so blurry. Uh, you know, when we started this work, we 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 changed the depth of the fjord by several hundred meters. Um, so uh, uh, exploring these. Uh, these fjords with an instrument that's good to a, a meter is sometimes a little bit of an overkill. Uh, but the detail is, is important when we want to resolve a ridge. Uh, we want to know uh, uh, 
deep this ridge is, if, if we know it only within 100 meters, that's not good enough. We need to know it better than that. Within 10, 20 meters sounds about right. Well, Eric, this has been awesome. I want to thank you so much for taking the time. Happy Earth Day. And uh, we appreciate okay, yes. <laughs> we appreciate so much all what you're doing really on behalf of UCI and on behalf of the planet. Um, it's really inspiring. So thanks very much. I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. And, and good luck, Eric, with everything. Thank you, James. Thanks for organizing that. And I hope our audience uh, had a good time watching this and uh, I encourage everyone to come visit Greenland. Uh, uh, beautiful place, beautiful nature. <laughs> Great. All right. So long. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.